Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Chicago Public Library program, uh, the Barrier Breaking Byline of Wendell Smith. Uh, my name is Joshua Mabe. I'm a newspaper librarian here at the Chicago Public Library. And uh, yeah, today we're going to have the editor of the book, uh, Michael Scott Pfeiffer, and uh, a, a contributor to the book, um, Michael Marsh, here to talk about the book, talk about um, uh, uh, Wendell uh, Smith's legacy and his writing and his work and his life. Uh, so yeah, let me let me just make a brief introduction to them both. Some of the research was done here at the Chicago Public Library, and we've got a lot of resources for newspapers and periodicals, especially focused on Chicago um, uh, material. So if you have any questions or want to access any of that material, come check us out anytime. We're on the fifth floor of the Harold Washington Library. Um, so yeah, Michael Scott uh, Pfeiffer is the editor of the Wendell Smith Reader, Selected Writings on Sports, Civil Rights, and Black History by Wendell Smith. Uh, he lives in Gainesville, Florida. Uh, and Michael Marsh is a paralegal and freelance writer based in Chicago, Illinois. So uh, yeah, let's welcome Michael and Michael. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, um, Michael Scott, uh, you want to... Um, Give us a little introduction on the book, uh, what's, what it's all about, and the motivation for, for producing it. Yeah, the original intent was I wanted to do a biography of Wendell Smith. That's also something I did not know Michael had been working on for 25 years. Uh, so I switched over to do um, a editing uh, a collection of his writings. And then Michael came in to do the introduction which really is sort of a bio sketch it's about 15 to 20,000 words but it's about as thorough as a biography or a bio sketch as you can get uh, because Michael had Michael started early doing his interviews so a lot of the people he spoke with 25 years ago are no longer with us so I think I think the introduction is something that cannot be replicated easily because, because Michael has some sources there that are no longer with us the book is structured um, is organized uh, basically to uh, try to communicate what Wendell was all about, what he devoted his life to. So in his writings, he tried to communicate Black history. So we have a chapter on Black history. He traveled a lot, so we have something on foreign affairs. He was always combating racism, so we have a chapter on that. One of the unique things about him was that he actually really celebrated progress. So we have a whole chapter just on him writing about progress as it was being made um, throughout his life. So that's how we have a couple of the more colorful characters, Muhammad Ali, Jackie Robinson, we have chapters on that. Um, so, so that's basically what we try to do, structure it. Not, so it's not just like a best of type of collection, but it's a collection that really reflects uh, what Wendell devoted his life to, which would be advancing the opportunity for the next generation of Black Americans. And Michael Marsh, uh, Michael Scott mentioned that you have been working on a uh, book for 25 years. Like, uh, what, how did you first learn about Wendell Smith? Well, how did you come to his work and what, uh, what inspired you to work on a biography of him? Oh, good question. Um, back in the mid 1990s, I worked at the Chicago Sun-Times uh, in the high school sports department. And uh, one night I had a conversation with Robert Kirsten. At the time, Robert was working in the sports department as well. And he later became an author himself. He uh, asked me uh, about famous black pictures. So being you know, a little bit cocky, I said, sure. Uh, Bob Gibson and Fergie Jenkins, pretty easy stuff. And Bob mentioned, um, what about uh, Satchel Paige and Bullet Joe Rogan? the two Negro League players. And I, you know, so I was slightly embarrassed that I'd forgotten about those guys. So uh, within the next uh, day or so, I ran to a bookstore and bought a book called The um, Only the Ball Was Right, Only the Ball Was White. It was written by Robert Peterson. And so I, you know, brushed up on my Negro League baseball history. But the book also mentioned Wendell Smith. And because I was an int I was interested in journalism at the time, I wanted to know a little bit more about him. So I started doing some, uh, you know, basic research. I went to the Sun Times Morgan, dug up some articles, and then when I learned that I had grown up only 
at less than a mile from his home, I was I grew really excited. And that uh, sparked me to uh, further research his life and work. Mm, nice. Um, so yeah, my speaking of his life and work, uh, uh, Michael Scott Pfeiffer, I, I'm gonna, I, maybe I'll just refer to you both as your last names, Pfeiffer and Marsh. Is that all right? Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, Pfeiffer, uh, yeah, uh, speaking of his life and work, do you want to give us a little sketch of, of uh, what Michael wrote about so beautifully in those first 15 to 20,000 words at the beginning of the book, but uh, you can just maybe give us a briefer summary here. Well, he was born and raised in Detroit, and he attended college at West Virginia State. And from there, he went to the Pittsburgh Porter. And he wrote for the Pittsburgh Porter from 1937 to 1967. But around 19, what was it, Michael? 1947, 1948, he moved to Chicago. In that area. Yeah. Yeah, he, uh, it was in August of 47, and he started writing at the Chicago Herald American. Yeah. And he did that for about 15 years. He was actually a, uh, I think he was initially brought there to write about boxing. So while we all know about him as the guy who wrote about Jackie Robinson, Wendell wrote as much about boxing as he did about baseball. But then he became a beat writer for the White Sox from 1959 to 1963. And that was unique because there really weren't many black baseball writers at the time. So that was, that was a big deal. And from there, he actually started going into broadcast journalism. And that was one of the real advantages of bringing Michael into the project because I'm dealing only with his writing. But so much of what Wendell pioneered was actually in TV and radio. So Michael was able to really hit on that, address that heavily in his introduction. But Wendell never stopped writing. Um, he wrote for a couple of years. He had a column with Chicago Sun Times, and he even wrote a couple of book reviews for the Chicago Tribune. And he did some magazine pieces along the way, some for Ebony, and then one for Tuesday at Home Magazine. He wrote a few of his pieces for them. We did a wide variety of writing for a wide variety of publications, and then he also uh, goes through some books um, for, for other athletes. So he had a, he had a writing career that spanned a wide range, but I really think the thing that uh, Michael brought into the fore was his broadcast journalism. And there probably at, at some point in time, that would be a great opportunity for a documentary, a film of some sort, to really either Wendell's work individually, or maybe just a collection of the pioneers um, in black broadcast journalism. And the thing to keep in mind about what, from day one, Wendell practiced what you would call advocacy journalism in the long line of uh, Black writers before him, Frederick Douglass, Ida B. Wells. He was constantly, he was advocating for equal rights, but that idea of advocacy journalism is something that's really important. And I, I noticed that word, that phrase is used a lot in the uh, forward and introduction. And would that be how Wendell Smith would phrase it himself? Was that was that the term of the time? Is that what he referred to his own work as? I, I Michael, I, I think, go ahead, Michael, take that. He, uh, it, it's definitely a, um, a term that arguably, uh, you know, is used by journalists. But um, uh, one of the key parts about Wendell Smith's career was that uh, he was an advocate and he definitely uh, pushed for uh, advancement of African Americans, particularly in sports. However, he he was also a very well-rounded journalist. Uh, he was not a racial demagogue in terms of uh, you know criticism. He was an equal opportunity critic. He was a very good writer. He was an established uh, interviewer, and he was a conscientious gatherer of facts. So yes, while he did um, advocate for you know, black athletes. He, I think, part of his uh, part of the uniqueness of his career was that he was such a well-rounded journalist uh, at the time. And yeah, uh, we had uh, Michael Marsh explain how he came to uh, Wendell Smith's writing. Uh, Michael Pfeiffer, do you uh, want to tell us the same? Like, uh, how did you first become aware of Wendell Smith? What what inspired you to start working on this? Well, certainly seeing the movie Forty Two because he was prominently 
um, portrayed in that. And surely there are, there are a couple of books that mention his name. So I think from a couple of different directions, his name hit me. And I thought, you know, that's a guy I'd be interested in learning more about. So I actually wanted to read a biography of Wendell Smith, and I couldn't find one. Couldn't find anything. And that's what really made me start looking into it, the fact that I wanted to read the book. So we ended up writing the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, um, one thing that I noticed in the book is he 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 was a... a fierce advocate, but he also not conservative politically, but very proper and very seemingly uh, concerned with uh, decorum. And um, I don't know, there's not a good way to phrase it. Like, uh, it, you phrased it well, because that, that's a good point. I and mean, that's a perceptive point. He wasn't politically conservative, but he was behaviorally conservative. And yes. He was very conscious, as was Jackie Robinson, that they were being watched. There's a lot of people who would like to see them stumble and fail. So they don't want to feed that. So they really were conscious of how they behaved, how they treated people. Um, Wendell even wrote a couple of columns directed to fans, Black fans, to say, hey, you guys are being watched too. So it's really important. We're all in this together. We all have a role. We have to behave properly and we have to show we belong. We're Americans. That's what we want to be. We don't want to be Black Americans. We want to be Americans. But, but to do that, we have to be good on and off the field at all times. So yeah, that, that, was, that was an important part of how he behaved. His behavior was conservative, but he was, I think we're pretty sure, Michael, he was a Democrat, right? So I mean, he wasn't yeah, he's totally conservative. Oh, he's definitely, uh, he was definitely a Democrat. He, uh, and as you know, he spent uh, much of his uh, work, work, working life here in Chicago. And he also lived on the South side of Chicago, which is a democratic, uh, is a democratic town. Uh, and uh, Scott is at, actually is very correct about uh, Wendell Smith being a Democrat. And I, and I, I should also uh, point out too, that, um, Part of the reason why he was so interested in Jackie Robinson is that he felt that the in, by integrating Major League Baseball, he was helping uh, to advance American ideals of uh, equality and democracy. But um, Scott, Scott is right. I mean, politically, I, I mean, uh, on a personal basis, uh, Wendell Smith was rather conservative. I mean, I, we all have to remember he was born in 1914. So uh, you have a different... Uh, different mentality in the black community at that time. Uh, in fact, um, Bill Smith was very uh, bothered by the fact that Muhammad Ali had changed his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. But that that what really wasn't done, so. Yeah, it was back when respectability politics had a different meaning and a different, uh, different impact. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, speaking of, uh, we brought up Jackie Robinson a couple of times, but I mean, it, I guess that's the part of his life that has been the most talked about and the most uh, fictionalized in the movie 42, as you say. Um, can we, can you tell us just a little bit about that, you know, that biggest part of his life, his, his, his early interaction and uh, the promotion of Jackie Robinson uh, through his, his work? Oh, sure. I can, uh... Talk, talk about that. Um, it's very interesting. Wendell Smith first met Jackie Robinson when when he took Robinson and two other black ball players to Boston for a trial with the Boston Red Sox. So I'm, I'm assuming at that time, uh, Wendell Smith was able to size up Jackie Robinson. On the way back to the Pittsburgh Courier, Wendell Smith stopped by uh, the Brooklyn Dodgers offices where Branch Rickey was having a press conference about starting a new black baseball league. After the press conference, Rickey pulled Wendell Smith aside and asked, which of those did, did, did any of the ball players that Wendell Smith took to Boston uh, have what it takes to make the major leagues? Funnily enough, Wendell Smith picked Jackie Robinson. It's, it's actually rather surprising. The other two guys, Marvin Williams and Sam Jethro, were veterans of the Negro Leagues and had, in fact, played uh, uh, in the All-Star game. On the other hand, Ro Jackie Robinson was only in his first season 
uh, with the Kansas City Monarchs. So we, so we know that um, Wendell Smith saw something in Jackie Robinson during that trip to Boston that made that compelled him to recommend Jackie Robinson to Branch Rickey. Uh, afterward, uh, Wendell Smith traveled with Jackie Robinson um, in 1946 and also 1947 to uh, serve not only as a mentor, but to help him uh, uh, with travel accommodations in cities that, you know, were, you know, segregated at the time. And as you know, uh, Wendell Smith also ended up writing uh, the first biography of Jackie Robinson. So, uh, so they developed a pretty close relationship at one time. And that probably, did that overshadow his career? Was he always known as like, I mean, not overshadow, but did that always uh, uh, loom large in his career where would, would he be the Jackie Robinson guy or was he, I mean, he obviously developed a career for decades after the oh. fact, but was he always, was his legacy always tied to Jackie Robinson? Well, uh, yes and no. The fact is, Wendell Smith made his career, I mean, that's his career. Uh, uh, he, his first, that's that's a major break for Wendell S Smith. But um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, he was a well-rounded journalist. So he did move on uh, to other advances in his career. Uh, yes, uh, the Jackie Robinson uh, campaign uh, pretty much uh, uh, established Wendell Smith as a prominent journalist. But uh, journal Wendell Smith later, uh, he moved on. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, he was known as a very um, good boxing writer and one of the tops in this field. He um, also became sort of a pioneer here in Chicago. And if we go back to his broadcast career, he was one of the first uh, Blacks hired to uh, work in television here in Chicago. And he was, in fact, the first uh, Black uh, sportscaster here in the city. Uh, he also was the first Black president of the uh, Chicago Journalism Club here. So um, Wendell Smith had gained the respect and admiration of many of his peers here in the field. And he also served as an inspiration for other uh, Blacks here in Chicago. The um, you know, Bryant Gumbel acknowledged that <laughs> he was inspired by Wendell Smith uh, back in the 1960s when he was a high school student here in the city. Um, and Michael Piper, let's uh, maybe go through the book as structured, as you said, it's structured thematically. Um, so, you know, obviously we there's a chapter on Jackie Robinson, a, a chapter on uh, foreign politics and racism. And uh, do you want to go into those a little mm -hmm. bit, like the major thrusts, the, the major uh, subjects of his career? Yeah, there's always some subjectivity uh, when you decide which articles go into which category. I mean, technically, the whole thing could be one big chapter of fighting racism, because that's what it all was. But the way he did it is, I think, kind of unique. The Pittsburgh Courier, I mean, a Black newspaper, and basically the largest Black newspaper in the nation, and they had, they had 10, 11, 12 different editions depending on which region of the nation it was distributed to. So that was a really a unifying thing. The, the Pittsburgh Courier was a unifying uh, aspect of the black population nationwide. So Wendell took it upon himself to try and educate his readers in black history, because at the time there were no black history courses, no black studies programs, anything like that. So he took it upon himself to educate uh, his readers in, in black history. And the unique thing about it is Let's talk about the way things are portrayed today. If you take a movie like The Blind Side, um, you wonder who that movie was about. Was the movie about uh, Sandra Bullock's character? It was a movie about Michael Orr. Michael Orr was kind of presented in a passive way. He was saved by his white fairy godmother. Wendell didn't write about black history that way. Wendell's, the characters in Wendell's black history were black individuals who were active, and initiate it to change in their lives. So, so that was a, something that really stood out to me. He gave uh, examples of black heroes for individuals, people who really did things for themselves. He traveled a lot, but we have a chapter in there about foreign affairs, because he was able to see America from a different perspective. So the Cold War was a big factor in Wendell's life. 
he was extremely anti-communism. So there you, you talk about politically, he, he was a Democrat, but a Democrat can be strongly anti-communist too at that time. So he certainly did that. Um, he, he had a unique ability or, to uh, criticize people he liked and praise people he didn't like. One of his big, uh, I think perhaps his, his greatest accomplishment was integrating spring training facilities. He wrote vehemently on that because the difference between the integration of Major League Baseball and spring training facilities integration, the thing that happened in between those two times was Brown versus Board. So Brown versus Board of Education meant that the segregation of spring training facilities was really in violation of the law. And he just pounded that, pounded that column after column because he couldn't get any of the black players, any of the black stars to get out in front of the issue because they didn't want to be perceived as troublemakers. So he basically called out those guys and called them Uncle Toms and Fat Caps. And those are strong words. Wendell didn't use those casually. So when he, when he really felt strongly about an issue, he got out in front of it and he pounded away. He preferred to walk to work behind the scene. But if necessary, he'd go out there and take the stand. So we do talk a lot about in the book about his uh, efforts to integrate spring training facilities. So, so we're really talking more in the book. It isn't a best of collection, which is somewhat subjective. And I did organize each column chronologically within the chapter. But really, there are, most of those pieces are independent of one another. But, but they're really designed to give you the broad flavor of how one to approach um, trying to advance opportunities for Black Americans. Yeah, speaking of the, the integrating spring training, and that's one of the sections in the introduction that uh, uh, you quote him writing about the vice president of the Milwaukee Braves. Um, and he really, like you said, does not mince words. Uh, basically calls... Bertie Tippett's the vice president of the Milwaukee Braves uh, uh, on this issue that not only was he a crappy ball player, but he was equally crappy at, as a manager and as a leader on this issue. It was just like, uh, it was pulling in uh, um, some, I'm sure some uh, sore subjects for, for the man. It was just definitely the, the harshest bit of writing that's quoted in the introduction. Well, I think it shows how, how he had to restrain himself a lot of the time. I mean, he had a lot of anger in him that he had to swallow. He was basically, I think, a friendly guy. Mm -hmm. But he experienced racism, too. He didn't just write about other people who experienced the racism. He, he experienced it, too. And uh, over time, it, it, it irritates you. I'm sure that builds. But then, like I said, when the law started to change, now he's no longer asking for favors anymore. Give, give this Black individual an opportunity. Now it's the law. You know, now, now let's go. He, I mean, he, he had a reason for being impatient. You know, not he didn't just wasn't just anger boiling over. I mean, it was anger, but it was backed by the law now. Oh yeah, yeah. I was just pointing out how uh, 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 sharp tipped his his writing was in that respect. It was like, oh yeah, that was, that was brief, concise, and to the point, and uh, really hits you. Yeah, um, Scott is absolutely right, and uh, uh, Wendell Smith could uh be angry and and i also and i also want to point out too uh, he was he could be he was a very versatile writer he he could write angry when he had when he really felt he had to but he could also write a very nice you know slice of life piece about a a, a ball player you know in his surroundings uh he could you know he could try to he could he tried to use some humor occasionally in his writings but um, he was um, uh, one, one, during his youth. He was a pitcher, and so when I think, so you know, as as we know, a pitcher can vary you know, the throws. And Wendell was sort of that way as a writer. You know, he could be humorous at times. He could be uh, blunt, or he could be uh, quite mild. So he, whenever the, he, one of his talents as a writer was his ability to um, use different approaches depending on the situation. Um, so just to give like a brief sketch of, of the trajectory of his career, like we, we've talked about, we've been jumping back and forth for every, uh, all, the, all the writings he's done, but he started out the Pittsburgh Courier, 
and wrote there yes. for a decade or so before he moved here to Chicago? Well, actually, he um, he was he was uh, basically full time at the Courier uh, from 1937 into 1947. Uh, in August of 1947, he uh moved to Chicago and joined the Chicago, the uh, Chicago Herald American. So for maybe about five or six years, he split time between Chicago and Pittsburgh. And by the early uh, 1950s, he fully settled in Chicago and passed on the uh, the torch to another sports editor at the Pittsburgh Courier. And then uh, he worked in print journalism here in Chicago until the, until the early 1960s when he joined WBBM around 1963. And then a year later, uh, in 1964, Wendell Smith joined WGN Television, and there he um, worked until he passed away in 1972. And uh, so he was a uh, broadcast journalist at the same time he was writing, because he also wrote for the Trib and the Sun Times uh, for in the late 60s to oh. early 70s. Yeah, he uh, he he was able to uh, he was able to uh, work that out. Uh, basically. Uh, Wendell Smith did make the adjustment to broadcast journalism, uh, but at, at heart he was a he was a newspaper guy. Yeah, the book um, says some has some criticisms, mild criticisms of his sort of like uh, um, his announcer voice and his announcer his personality as an announcer was maybe slightly lacking. Yeah, he uh, overall he was a good broadcast journalist, but uh, the one of the things I, I have to keep remembering remembering is that um he was relatively old when he joined uh when he worked started working in television i mean he was i think he was almost 40 and uh, so you're talking about asking a guy to you know who was a writer all his life to you know make the adjustment to yeah right so he did make the adjustment in terms of his uh writing ability and he uh developed you know a passable enough presence on television I, I the one thing I can say though is that as a journalist, he still demonstrated uh, strong journalistic abilities at the at WGN. I mean, they had enough confidence in him to uh, send send him out to cover the uh, Richard Speck murder case, and he was the first uh, television journalist at WGN to uh, take on that story. Mm -hmm. And he also he also was good enough to cover the Jimmy Hoffa trial back in the mid sixties. So he. It, he did have strong journalism chops yeah um well let's uh by the way i don't think we've shown the uh oh no oh no because of my background i can't show the book oh well kind of anyway that's good enough thank <laughs> yeah uh that's a little awkward with my little zoom background uh but while we're talking about the book um maybe both of you maybe starting with uh, uh, uh michael scott pfeiffer uh, can go over some of your favorite pieces in the book, some of your highlights. Well, one of my favorite pieces was the uh, what he did in 1939. So he was only two years into his career. So he, you're talking about a guy who's like 25 years old. And he had been told that black players, black baseball players, the managers would not play with would not tolerate black teammates. And he was told that by the commissioner's office and by some of the team owners. And he really showed strong journalistic skills where he said, I want to hear it from the horse's mouth. So he actually, each National League baseball team came into Pittsburgh to play the Pirates. He interviewed players from that team. And it turned out 75% of the players he spoke with said, no, we'd be perfectly happy playing with black teammates. We want to win. And if that gets him winning faster, that's what we'll do. So right off the bat, he really showed the ability, the, the strong journalistic sense. So rather than just do the lazy thing and go find out what somebody says through a second source, actually go directly to the source and ask them. And I think that started to change a little bit of his own perception of uh, how much progress might actually be potential here in, in America, because the first year of his writing, he was sort of confrontational, and he, and he did a piece on then to a black baseball fans. Why do you even bother going to white baseball games? They don't want you. Just stay in the black community. I think some of those early pieces that he wrote in, in that 
the, those interviews with the uh, National League players that they came in really made him think, hmm, you know, there's some potential here to, to make progress as things are working within a system, so to speak. So, so that was that was a key. It, it, eight columns that you wrote, one for each National League team, and it took a lot of words, and I was limited how many words I could use, so I only used one of them. It was with the St. Louis Cardinals, but that was that was such an influential, um, such a, an influential set of columns that really you could see the tone starting to change. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, and that was used in their later on. They made a presentation. Wendell Smith and several other prominent uh, 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 black leaders at the time made a presentation to Major League Baseball years before right. the integration, and that was used as a source material in their presentation. Yeah, well, unsuccessfully. I'm trying to remember. I know that uh, uh, Wendell Smith. And uh, several members of the uh, of the black of a black publishers group attended a meeting uh, of major league uh, executives to push for integration of the major of major league baseball. And I know that uh, Paul Robeson uh, led the uh, led the presentation, which uh, went nowhere. Uh, but Wendell Smith later pointed out that. The one person in the room who who looked somewhat interested was uh, Branch Rickey. So go figure. Um, I should kindly point out too. Um, uh, Scott did an incredible job of selecting the uh, the articles for the book, and uh, there was one in particular that I think uh, was especially uh, excellent. Uh, it, it's a column that Wendell Smith wrote about Muhammad Ali after his uh, first fight with Joe Frazier. So uh, Wendell Smith was the only reporter in, in the uh, in the room, along with Muhammad Ali, Ali's trainer, uh, the singer Diana Ross, and Muhammad Ali's mother. And it, the column was so well written. It was a perfect example of how a reporter should observe the loser's locker room. It was very, it was very empathetic uh, because it, it was such an emotional scene. Because Ali's mother was there, she was obviously concerned about her son, and uh, Ali was comforting her as well as uh, Diana Ross. Uh, it was especially uh, excellent given that. Uh, Wendell Smith did not really think much of Muhammad Ali as a bo as a boxer. Uh, Wendell thought that uh, Ali was a little too cocky. So um, that is that's that's one of the uh, pieces that uh, really stand out in the collection. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to um, talk about the book specifically? Any other articles you want to point out? Uh, yeah. A lot of them are quite. Oh, go ahead. You know, I, was say, I thought one of the best, just the best writing, not just the sports related, but was on the assassination of uh, John F. Kennedy. When President Kennedy was assassinated, Wendell incorporated Ernie Davis, who was the first Black Heisman Trophy winner out of Syracuse, who before he even played his first game in the NFL, passed away from leukemia. So Wendell interwove those two stories of two young men dying before they had a chance to really reach their potential. And the way he tied it together was that Ernie Davis, when he won the Heisman and was in New York City receiving the Heisman Trophy, it so happened that John F. Kennedy was in there in the, in the city as well. And they were able to meet just briefly, but that meant so much to Ernie Davis to actually have met the president of the United States. And then Wendell steps back and goes, there's two young guys, they're gone. And it's just, you can just tell, He's just sad. He doesn't. He doesn't try and use any flowery descriptions or anything. He just tells the story, and the story's just so sad. But I thought it was really interesting writing. Yeah. I think there was another note, uh, another piece in the uh, collection that's especially notable. I, I, I remember Wendell Smith's piece about the female boxing trainer. Yeah. Uh, right. And I thought that piece was especially notable because Wendell Smith had the insight to actually write about a woman training professional boxers. And this is back in the uh, 
I want to say 1940s. Yep, 1940s, so, yeah. The fill in. Yeah. Yes. And uh, that column was, was uh, I thought that piece was pr pretty significant because they showed um, uh, Wendell's ability to uh, recognize talent regardless, regardless of gender. I mean, so I, I, I thought that column, that piece was pretty important too. And uh, uh, Joshua, uh, yeah. before this, the time is up, I really want to uh, give a shout out to you and the Chicago Public Library uh, I, because- I, because there was some crucial bits of research that I needed to get done. And the Chicago Public Library uh, provided some assistance. And for that, I'm, I'm quite grateful. And that, that that was three different departments, the Special Collections Department, uh, your Newspaper Department, and the Interlibrary inter, uh, Loans Department. Oh, yeah. I need, yeah, I needed all three. Um, <laughs> and the, the Special Collections Department in particular uh had had has the uh records from the Chicago Journalism Club that Wendell Smith uh uh served on for a number of years so it was it was nice to pick up uh so a few tidbits about Wendell Smith's time there uh yeah. well we're very very much glad we were able to help and uh yeah folks come look at the materials we have um Maybe we can open it up if anybody else wants to. We just got something in the chat here, so I'll read this. And if anybody else who's watching wants to throw out a question or a comment, we can do that. Um, so I get this comment here. His time with the Pittsburgh Courier co coincided with a period when Pittsburgh was a hotbed of black culture, sports, jazz, theater, et cetera. By the time he moved to Chicago, quote unquote, urban renewal efforts in Pittsburgh had started to destroy the vibrant but black neighborhoods. Was that rise and fall commented on or reflected in any of Wendell's writing? Uh, I would say, uh, uh, unfortunately, no. Um, yeah, when uh, Wendell Smith moved to Chicago, he pretty much, uh, I mean, he sort of focused on uh, uh, Chicago. Uh, so, um, even though Wendell Smith had served as city editor of the Courier, uh, to be honest, his focus was really uh, more on sports. So no, no, unfortunately, um, not unfortunately, no. Yeah, he he didn't really. Even when he was in Pittsburgh, he didn't really write about Pittsburgh a lot. I mean, I know he had a he was a friend of Lena Horne, the entertainer. Uh, father Teddy Horn, he palled around with him a lot, so he had that. He knew he knew the performers. He, in fact, he wrote a column. I didn't include it in the collection, but with Lena Horn, um, so, so he had that a little bit. But he didn't really write a lot about Pittsburgh, even when he was in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we'll just give it a. Maybe you guys can, uh, uh, if you have any final thoughts on this, we can see if anybody else pipes in with a question or a comment in the meantime, but um, yeah, anything else you want to say about the book or about the uh, Wendell's life and career or, yeah. I just, if we just go back to the, um, the issue of advocacy journalism, just to be clear, advocacy journalism didn't mean you can distort facts or in any way misrepresent the truth. You're still pursuing the truth, it's just you have a certain perspective, a certain belief, and you're working towards that you're presenting your argument, but but you still have to be fair, balanced, and, and not distort the facts. So advocacy journalism is not inconsistent with honest journalism. I I agree, and um, I I would um, uh, point out, respectfully point out too that. Um, because Wendell Smith was, in fact, a well-rounded journalist over a 35-year career, I, I, I feel like um, he it, it, his status as a well-respected journalist, as a well-rounded journalist, uh, in a way enhances his uh, advocacy journalism or his uh, civil rights activism. Because we know that when Wendell Smith approached a subject, he did it as a journalist and not as a radical settling racial scores. Um, he earned the, the respect and admiration of many of his peers. Uh, he served as a, as a, as a 
as an inspiration to other people. Um, and he was, in fact, a journalistic pioneer. Yeah. Oh, we oh got one more comment here. Wendell Smith ghost wrote a regular column for Jackie Robinson for the Pittsburgh Courier during Robinson's first season with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, I don't imagine you guys include any of his ghost writing in the... Uh... Well, I mentioned uh, one piece in the introduction. Uh, it was the piece that... Uh, that was published after the Philadelphia Phillies racially harassed Jackie Robinson in uh, 1947, a week after his major league debut. Uh, the, 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 the players, including the manager, hurled this really nasty garbage at Jackie Robinson, and he had to, he took it. Uh, the problem, the column that uh, was produced afterwards sort of downplayed the incident, which I thought was... Uh, Interesting because, uh, you know, years later, even Jackie Robinson pointed out that he was quite angry about it. Yeah. Um, well, thank you both. I think we're coming up on our, our time here. So let me see. I try again to, to hold up the book here, the Wendell Smith Reader. Uh, <laughs> I'll put up a better video of it for the YouTube at the end, but uh, or a better image of the book. But uh, check it out from the Chicago Public Library. Buy it from McFarland Press, wherever books are sold um yeah and thank you both michael and michael okay. uh, joshua thank you yeah appreciate it all right thanks yeah good night